<laughs> Have y'all ever read that book, uh, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie? Yeah, yeah. So the same concept applies if you give a, if you give a drag queen a microphone. You don't know what's going to happen next, all right? So, <laughs> no, y'all, I am so elated to be here with y'all celebrating a legacy of liberation that has flowed not from the walls of this sanctuary, but from the hearts of those who dwell in these pews over the past decades. Today, we are celebrating the holy beauty of our queer power and uncentralized joy. Today, we partake in the co-creation of a new thing, a new idea of what church can look like, who church can be for, and how church can operate. Today, we hear the biblical word of old from queerly liberated bodies of new. This. This is a place, a time, a space for you just as you are. No, no matter what has been said about you, to you, or spoken over you, you are enough. Let it be known that you right here, right now are enough, and this is all you will ever have to be. You, your whole self, your unapologetic self, your divinely heretical and questioning self, is not only welcomed, but celebrated here. And I am honored to be with y'all. As Christopher said, my name is Miss Pity Cost, and I use she, her, her pronouns when I am all dolled up like this, you know? Y'all, let me tell you something. I did not always look this, uh, this incredulously beautiful, all right? <laughs> let me tell you a story. So two and a half years ago, I painted my face for the first time, start staring into the mirror, meditating upon every pore, every line, every curve, partaking in a co-re-creation of flesh. My flesh, the flesh that had been downtrodden and discarded, discounted by so much of society, the flesh that had carried me through the experience of housing insecurity, the flesh that was worshiped by my queer lovers holy, recreated flesh that stared right back at me. And it was not a makeup masterpiece by any means. <laughs> but it was surprisingly me, right? So my debut in drag was far from the ball ballroom eleganza extravaganza that I had hoped it would be. But it was nonetheless an undeniably life-changing moment of liberation and grace to my inner and most shadowed self. As soon as my stilettos touched the stage of this, this sticky dive bar in the middle of nowhere in central Illinois, I felt this overwhelming power of peace over my entire being. This, this is exactly who I was meant to be, I thought. And so for the next two minutes and 57 seconds, give or take, uh, I paraded through the crowd and danced and lip synced to Laura Bell Bundy's You Can't Pray the Gay Away, which my dancing was, eh, well, it was more reminiscent of the awkward gyrations of a grandma trying to show her grandkids how hip she used to be, all right? <laughs> I am not known for my dancing, but um, as I was dancing through the crowd, there were several individuals who stood back in the back who, as they handled, handed me their crumpled dollar bills, they just mouthed, thank you. The song concluded, I gathered the last of my tips, I made my exit, and as I descended the stairway into the probably asbestos-ridden basement of this bar, I sent up a small prayer to the divine, thanking them for the opportunity to see myself, to feel the Holy Spirit, and to experience the peaceful assurance of love. So how, how was it that I was able to connect so powerfully with a divine through this art? <laughs> how was it that something so inherently queer and so historically unholy could hold such serific zeal? How was it that random strangers could be so moved by the comedic reclamation of church and God? These questions and about a thousand more were whirling and twirling through my mind, a lot like how I was hoping I would whirl and twirl through the crowd. 
but I digress, all right? One thing was clear, there is something going on here, something intrinsically powerful. And that moment of questioning two years ago when I began to perform set in motion a quest a quest to answer the unknown, to heal the hidden traumas and to upend the systems of oppression which permeate this weary and hurting world. And though I did not have the answers then, and unfortunately I still don't have the answers, uh, I do know that I have an idea, a route of new questioning, a foundation where I can get started with. You see, today I don this, this vestment of makeup, this, this beaded owl, these stoles of jewels to craft a work of art for God and for neighbor and for myself. It is the tangible manifestation of, of my current reality and holy queerness. It, it stands to represent everything that I was told I could never be and everything that I know the divine has made me to be. My drag has allowed me to imagine a formless and boundaryless parent in heaven because for far too long there has existed this false belief, this false dichotomy that queerness and holiness are juxtaposed, that they are completely unrelated. For far too long the cis heteronormative capital C church has claimed an unclaimable trademark on spirituality. For far, far too damn long, all right, systems of domination and oppression have wielded liturgy and scripture to lash the flesh of our bodies and to mangle the hearts and souls of ourselves. But, but Father Gustavo Gutierrez, who is the father of liberation theology, wrote, there are not two histories, one profane and one sacred, juxtaposed or closely linked. Rather, there is only one human destiny. We, we are of one history, one sacred history, one sacredly queer history of rebellion and of laughter. And today, here in this place, we say no more. No more to the bullshit that is exclusivity and the callousness of faith. We say no more to the elitism of pulpits and the scarcity of justice. As theologian Paulo Fieri wrote in The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, no matter where the oppressed are found, the act of love is a commitment to their cause, the cause of liberation. And so today, in this place, we uplift, we honor, and we celebrate the legacy of liberation and the future that is our hope all that stands before us and in front of us. For we, we are the collective temple bearers of the kingdom of God. We are named and known as heavenly queer couture, sewn together by a divine seamstress of cosmic creation. So every time we take a breath, every time we take a breath that the world does not want us to take, every time that we stand against tyrannical legislation aimed at limiting our bodily autonomy, every time we speak against defamatory claims of homophobia and racism and transphobia, we are doing so emboldened by the fierceness of a trans god, empowered by the spectrums of a queer spirit, and anointed by the authority of a non-conforming Christ of color. As we move into Pride Month, may we be reminded of the rambunctious collective power of disruption found in the historical figure of Christ. Christ, this fully human dude who, who sashayed into a corrupt temple of God, occupying it in protest and rage with a ragtag group of queer folks flog in hand, whipping the oppressors out of their house and liberating the margins, one flamboyant act of love and rage at a time. It was this flamboyant, 
flamboyantness of love and of rage, which has existed and persisted throughout our sacred history of queerness that was present at the start of the Stonewall riots. It was present at the start of the George Floyd marches. It was present at the North Dakota Access Pipeline, at Act Up New York, at, at Occupy Wall Street, at the reinstitution of two of the Tennessee Three. It was present at creation, and it was present now. We are called to acts of disruption in the face of hate. We are called to acts of defiance in the face of oppression. We are called to laughter in the face of institutionalized sorrow. We, especially those like me with the privilege of whiteness, have a duty to deconstruct, dismantle, and defund all which allows us to move easily within the systems we inherited through acts of attrition against common humanity. Because right now, right now we live in a world which seeks to rid itself of every flame of queer joy, of every ounce of black power, of every drop of feminine authority, and of every instance of marginalized economic mobility. Right now, we, as a beloved community, must come together to adapt and to change and to forge forth into this weary world with our fists raised into the air, with laughter filling our lungs, and with a reminder of the knowledge of our own worth echoing off of our lips and reverberating in the eardrums of all of our neighbors. That, that is the gospel of liberation. And as James Cone prophetically declared, the gospel of liberation is bad news to all oppressors because they have defined their freedom in terms of the slavery of others. No matter what the capitalist idolatry has basically claimed, we live not in a world of scarcity. We live in a world of abundance. We live in a world with enough for everyone, but only if those at the top halt their hoarding of wealth, of resources, and of power itself. In the spirit of pride, in the spirit of our queer ancestors, we may no longer sit idly by in, in wooden pews of fallen trees from lands that were stolen. We no longer may listen unshaken to the words of those dispersed seeking refuge from church-appointed supremacy. We no longer may allow the tears of our ancestors to be that of a well of sorrow for today. Today, we turn them into a raging river of defiant and resilient joy. For fear, fear shall be drowned out by our light, by your light, by our collective light. We cannot be expelled. Our minds, our bodies, our souls cannot be expelled from the wildfire that is God's unmistakable love. The kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom, but the kingdom of heaven itself exists within the bloodied bond of the margins. It swells when we come together. It overflows when we make a rambunctious noise. But most importantly, it overcomes when we speak out against all that is antithetical to Christ's life. A life of radical protest, unwavering love, and unfaltering community. You see, it is my belief that the God of transcendent love, the spirit of queer wisdom, and the sustainer of marginalized hope dwells here and now among us. The kingdom of God is not a glitzy, golden-gated community of an exclusive afterlife. No, the kingdom of God is present, existing between us in the vibrations of our voices, in the space between our atoms, the embrace between friends, the links between our arms of those who march and protest against injustice. The kingdom of God is a riot. The kingdom of God is a pride parade. The kingdom of God is Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, Harvey Milk, William Dorsey Swan, the kingdom of God is you and me. The kingdom of God is we. What we do with it, now that is up to us. Now the last thing I want to leave y'all with is this. We are on this precipitial moment of change. 
What happens over the next year will undoubtedly mark the course of an entire generation of queer folks. Hate has skyrocketed, legislation has passed, extremists are marching with arms against us. How we as a community come together to respond will shift the course of history. For the good or for the bad, change will happen. So to the allies in this room, your presence and your privilege is needed more than it has ever been needed before. If you have ever been to a drag show, if you've ever told a queer person that they are loved or have a hope for a peaceful time, you must act. So call your representatives and, and donate to LGBTQIA2S plus nonprofits. Listen to queer folks because you are needed. And to the queer folks in the room, worried and disheartened by the state of our world, know this, you, you are wanted, celebrated, and loved. Your existence is needed and necessary. Your mind is beautiful. You are created and recreated as good. Your joy is an act of rebellion. Your laughter is an act of protest. Your very heartbeat is an act of defiance. So may we embrace the history of rebellion, the beauty of radicalness, the spirit of joy, and the collective power of our voices. Because our lives, the lives of our loved ones, they depend on it.